for me, like, I'm a human. Like, yes, I am a black gay man, and I'm also a trail runner that likes to go run really far. But, like, at the end of the day, like, we are people. And so, basically, it comes down to treat people how you want to be treated. That's, you know, kind of like the number one rule. This is Running For Real, the podcast for runners who know that for every runner's high, there are just as many lows. All those just missed PRs, easy runs that feel hard, injury blues, and more. Each week, we'll talk to running, health, and wellness experts about their highs, lows, and best advice to build our confidence. Running For Real is about being honest, being brave, and most of all, not feeling alone. And now here's our host, Tina Muir. Hello, my friends. Welcome to episode 211 of the Running Thrill podcast and episode three in this World Toughest Race Eco Challenge series. I am really excited that you are enjoying this as much as I have been. And if you are enjoying these episodes, I hope you are giving them a share, letting other people know about them. It's a pretty unique series here and it goes into, yes, most of the athletes that we have on the show are runners, but it also kind of explores some potential future territory for most of us. We love to run. This year, however, has shown us that running can't be everything. Races can't be everything. And challenging yourself, finding new ways to explore your potential is something really enjoyable and meaningful. And I hope this has given you a sense of Hmm, I wonder if I could do this. And today's episode is not going to be any exception to that. You are certainly going to get a dose of that today. I certainly have been feeling that I want to explore my potential in the adventure racing world someday. Who knows when that might be, but I hope you are continuing to enjoy these and thinking about your potential and what you are able to do. Now, I am excited that episode three is with Corey Waltering, who is primarily a runner himself. We spend most of this episode talking about his running experience as an ultra runner, about a 1200 mile run that he did over the course of 21 days. And just getting to know him as a a black man who is a gay man, who is someone who really believes that not only are those two things important, but having trail runners and athletes be represented from the Midwest is a real passion of his. And it's something I would not have expected. It's not something that you hear people talking about very much, but you will hear that it is definitely a passion project for him. And he's now sponsored by North Face, which is absolutely awesome and and really happy for him. So before we get into this episode with Corey, I just want to take a moment to thank our sponsor, You Can, for allowing me to do these episodes by giving me the support to to cover them and to put in the time and the money and the investment and the energy into recording these because podcasts do take a lot of energy. They take a lot of time and preparation and reaching out to guests to finding a time can be particularly difficult. As you will hear, Corey and I had uh, some trouble finding an episode time as well. So I want to thank Generation You Can for allowing me to do this. And You Can is an ideal sponsor for these episodes because it is a product you could take with you. And I've mentioned that I've used You Can as my marathon fuel source in the past, and it is the sole nutrition that I rely on in my marathons. But you also could use it for your ultra running, your adventure racing needs, and they are coming out with some new products that will definitely play a part, I have a feeling, in these worlds in the future. So you can use the code TINAMUA25 to get 25% off your order if you are a first time customer, or you can use the code TINAYUCAN15 for 15% off if you are already a big fan of UCAN as I am. I actually recently took my UCAN with me on my longest trail run ever, which was two hours and 37 minutes. And yes, I am counting those 37 minutes because that's more than my marathon PR. So for me, that was a long time to be out there in the trails. We did almost 14 miles. I loved every second and I really enjoyed my You Can Refuel halfway around. I absolutely downed the cookies and cream protein two scoops in my in some coconut water because I wanted to get some extra electrolytes and I just downed it in probably 10 seconds. It was gone and I loved every mouthful of it, every gulp. I also am a massive fan of the bars. I have at least one of those a day. My favorites are the salted peanut and the peanut butter chocolate. And now the weather is cooling down. I can get myself more of those chocolate peanut butter bars without worrying about them melting. So again, you can go to generation.co and use code TINAMUA25 to get 25% off your order if you are new. 
or you can use Tina You Can 15 to get 15% off if you are a previous customer. Or you can go to generationyoucan.com forward slash discount forward slash Tina Muir and that will put the coupon codes straight in there for you so you don't have to worry about them. Thank you to Generation You Can for allowing me to go forward with these episodes. I am enjoying it. I hope you are too. All right, let's get to the interview with Corey Waltering. Corey, welcome to the Running Through podcast. I am excited to have you here on this Eco Challenge series special episode, but I also have an extra reason to have you on here being that you are primarily a runner and not just do it as part of training, but you are an ultra runner. So welcome to the show. I'm excited to have you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, this is going to be fun. And I love that you, uh, watching the the Eco Challenge World's Toughest Race series, I immediately found myself gravitating towards the people who were primarily runners because, I don't know, there's something about the running community that just feels special. And so it was really cool to see you you on there and be able to get you on here. And so we're going to dive a bit deeper um, into you as as a, as a runner, as a person, before we get onto the eco challenge stuff. So I want to start right at the beginning of your running career, being that I read that you did 400 and 800 in uh, high school and college. So tell us a bit about that. Where did you go to college? Did you show promise early on? How was the early days of your running career? Yeah. So I actually started running when I was about seven years old. Oh, wow. And um, it was a race across the church parking lot across the street from my grandparents' house. Mm -hmm. And I thought I was a fast kid. So my grandpa challenged me to a race and he actually beat me uh, across the parking lot. So then I turned around and said, well, we have to go back. So then I beat him on the way back. So I'd say that the first race was a tie. Um, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> but yeah, so basically we figured out that I was decently fast at a young age. So like in junior high, like sixth, seventh, eighth grade, um, I was running the 200, the 400, the 800, went to state in junior high in the 400, the 800, and the 4 by 4 Wow. And so then in high school, I had a great freshman year of track. I mean, I was running cross country as well in Illinois, three miles, had an okay cross country season, but had a great track season, ended up running 158 in the 800 as a freshman. And they're like, and they're like, oh, this kid's going to be good. You know, Mm -hmm. they're super excited. And then I just kind of stalled out for a little bit when it came to the track and field side of things, but ended up getting pretty decent in in cross country. And then, um, finally my senior year, I ran like 157 or something like that. And it was like, Oh, okay. Like I'm finally getting my track legs back. So you were still improving in cross country, but you just kind of your top end speed kind of ran out for a while. Is that kind of what you mean? Yeah. Yeah. And so, cause like as a freshman, I ran like 53 seconds in the 400, I think. Mm-hmm. And, um, by my senior year, I was running like 52 ish or whatever, but like my 800 just was not getting better. And my mile was getting slightly better every year, but like cross country is just big improvements. So like, I don't know, but mm-hmm. it worked, I guess. So then, um, I ran cross country and track and field at Greenville college in Southern Illinois and, um, the jump from three miles to eight kilometers for cross country for me, was just, it was hard. Mm. I did not handle that change well. And I would say that I never actually had a good cross country season while I was in college. Really? Well, wow. yep. Um, just never, never could put it all together, but, um, then going back to the track, all of a sudden I'm going from like a 52 second 400 runner to now I could split 49 in the four by four and ran mm-hmm. 50 point in the open. And then I was a 418 miler. And so it was just kind of funny how like in high school Flip-flop. cross con- Yeah. But yeah. I was always, even through colleges still 400, 800, 1500. And then I ran a 5k on the track and had a great race and then ran another 5k on the track and had an awful race. So I'm like, let's just go back down. <laughs> and do you think that was mental or physical? Um, probably a bit of both. Mm. 
I'd actually say it was more mental though. Yeah. Just because even when I was in college, um, starting my junior year, actually no, starting my sophomore year, I was still, I was actually racing triathlon in the summer. So like I would do sprint and Olympic distance in the summers. And then my junior year, I decided that I wanted to start doing half Ironman stuff, which does not make any sense off of, you know, 400, 800 training. Wait, what did your coach think about this? Um, you know, he, he was happy that it was something that kept me injury free. Okay. And so, um, he, he was all for it. Okay. There are a couple, yeah, there are a couple moments though, (laughs) where, (laughs) where he was just like, are you sure you have to be racing half Ironman races over the summer? Cause like I would do three or four in a summer, Mm -hmm. but he's like, you know, if that's what keeps you training and keeps you happy, then like, let's go for it. So I actually had a triathlon coach and my track and field coach Mm -hmm. for my last like year and a half of college, which is also quite the experience, (laughs) but, um, but yeah, so I, I loved it though. Huh? Well, I mean, I wonder how that affect, how that kind of came out later in your, like at at this point in your, in your running career, whether that triathlon training, just kind of the keeping the lightness of it in it to keep enjoying the sport, being outdoors, whether that, do you feel like that has played a role in, in the path that you've taken? For me, triathlon was mainly because I did swim in high school also. Um, and so I was injured quite a bit as a freshman and sophomore. And so like, for me, it seemed like a logical choice to just get a bike and start doing it. Mm. And our college coach had finished like Ironman, I don't know, Ironman California or something. And so like, he was always like, you know, I think that actually he's like, you're going to be a better triathlete than a runner. Um, if that's what you choose to focus on after college. Um, and so I think in my head, I was almost thinking maybe I want to try to get a jump start on this, you know, being Mm. good after college, because, uh, realistically I wasn't going to qualify for nationals on the track or in cross country. And, um, I don't think that I would have done great as a, like trying to make it as a pro road runner. So yeah, triathlon kind of was, I thought it was fun. Hmm. That is interesting. And what about the, you know, we're going to, we're going to go on to talk about, um, being a black man in the, in the running community, but what about in triathlon? Did you, did you feel that there as well? Um, I didn't really think about it too much in triathlon because at that age, I was still just young enough where I'm like, I'm out here doing my thing, having fun Mm -hmm. and just really didn't think too much about it. Yeah. And so, you know, looking, uh, we kind of wanted to get into this later, but I guess I can, I can start it now, but you've spoken a lot about, uh, how important it is to have other role models and you are trying to be a role model for other black boys and girls who are coming up. And I've actually discussed this and for the listeners episode, uh, with Aaron and Joshua Potts, we talked about this exact thing about having role models, people to look up to. Did you, did you not really pay attention to that in the triathlon world? Was that again, just being young and carefree, I guess you just didn't really think about it. Yeah, absolutely. So like my role model, uh, when I was doing triathlon was actually Chrissy Wellington Mm. because I mean, she is arguably the most dominant female triathlete that there's ever been. Uh, I mean, she, she never lost an Ironman. Um, I mean, how many people can say that? And so I just thought that was awesome because like, it was just really cool to see someone so good at their sport and so consistent. And so like, that was my role model. And, but I wasn't doing it because I looked up to her. I was doing it just because like, this is what I wanted to do. But then I was like, oh, well, she's really cool. Yeah. Oh yeah, she is for sure. And for listeners, uh, I'll put the episode with Chrissy in the show notes so you can go listen because that was also a good episode. All right. So then you came out of college and decided to, or I didn't say decided, but ended up in uh, registered for a marathon and you hadn't run more than 16 miles at that point, but ended up running a 237. What do you remember feeling when you crossed the line running, having run a 237 off yeah, you know, definitely. I wouldn't say a long enough run to be able to handle that. <laughs> totally. Um, so the funny story, everyone's like, this is going to hurt. Like road marathon is going to feel a lot different than anything else you've done. Mm. And so 
everyone's like, go out slow. And I'm like, but I don't know what pace I should be running. So you had like, no I goals was, in mind for this? No. And okay. so like, I, I was actually living in Boulder and then I was coming back to the Quad Cities because it's very close to my hometown. So um, I go out for the first 20 miles and people are like, oh, that's when you're going to hit the wall. And they actually have like a blow up wall there <laughs> that you run through. And I was like, I'm feeling great. <laughs> and so, so I actually negative split the last 10 K of the race and I crossed the finish line. And I was like, well, that was actually really fun. Like I was super excited about the thought of racing more marathons and I missed being in the prize money by like one spot. I guess I think I was sixth and the top five got prize money or something. <laughs> so I was just like, well, I have to go back the next year then. <laughs> um, but yeah, like it was, it felt great to get that race over. And like, I honestly didn't even know if a 237 was good or not. Oh, really? So even <laughs> after the race, I mean, you obviously, like you said, knew that you were in the top of the field, but you didn't have any idea of how good the quality was even at that point. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So, and it's funny because my dad was there um, at the finish line and um, he had met someone from the Quad Cities that was um, working the race. And it, he's like, oh, yeah, my son should be running about like this time for the marathon. And it's his first one. And so she just goes, this cannot be his first marathon. But if it is, I want to be there to watch the finish of this. And so sure enough, like my dad's like, oh, yeah, there he is. <laughs> and it just they couldn't believe it. So they're actually really good friends of ours now. Oh, and I cool. go back and do and I do Quad Cities pretty much every year now and like every race they put on. That's so cool. Is that um, I've done Bix before. Is that one of the Quad Cities? One of those? Is that in that category or not? Yeah. So different race directors, but uh, same area. OK, yeah, yeah. That's I couldn't remember yep. who, who put that race on. OK, so then just curious, what did you get your marathon time down to? Two years later, I think, yeah, two years, uh, I ran 226 at Chicago. Mm -hmm. And it was funny because, like, Quad Cities was my first at 237. Then I ran Boulder Back Roads as a training day mm -hmm. and ran, like, 244. And people are like, how is this happening? And then, <laughs> and then my next marathon was Birmingham, Alabama, and ran 228 and then ran 226. Oh. And then it was just like, I'm done. <laughs> Done as in you no more marathons. That was the last one. Um, so I went back to Chicago one more time. Okay. And I ran two thirty or two thirty one there. And I was basically just like, I'm done with the road marathon. Okay. I was I was very happy with the two twenty six and yeah. you know, there's always that thought of like, what about trying to get down to the two nineteen for the mm. OTQ? But at the same time, like that's just so much specific training and I just can't focus for that long. So even at that point, you know, you, have you been someone who has been on Eco Challenge, the world's toughest race, lots of different disciplines, lots of activities, but even at that point, you like, it's, it's going to be hard for some of my listeners who are like the kind of people who do a spring marathon and a full marathon every single year. And, uh, that's kind of, they're always in some version of marathon training, but you, even at that point felt this is too repetitive. It's too, I don't want to say monotonous, but uh, you needed some more excitement. You felt that like you could understand that feeling within your heart right at that moment. Yes. And so like I've enjoyed all the marathons that I've done, but just the training for them is not necessarily what I enjoy. Mm -hmm. I always like to try new things. And I always say that I basically just want to know how it feels. Um, and so that's why I like to do all these different things mm -hmm. and being in, you know, a marathon training cycle month after month after month just ended up being like, all right, this is the loop I do for my long run. This mm -hmm. is where I do my speed work. And I just felt like I wasn't getting to see enough. So is that when trails came into it? Um, yeah, so trails came in, um, right around the time of my first marathon actually. Oh, okay. And, um, and so I was kind of doing like marathon workouts, but then racing some trail races in there as well. And honestly, like the first trail race I did, um, was just an absolute amazing experience. Um, I don't know that I necessarily did well, but I just, I remember the feeling of like, oh, this is really cool. And I could actually go around the country and well now around the world. But at that time I was just thinking I could go around the country and I could race on all of these different courses and 
like I can now go out and I can train on trails and I can, you know, have these different experiences rather than every day of the week being the same every single week. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I understand that. I actually, um, I have, I was a professional marathoner and then took some time off to have kids and now I'm starting to get on the trails and I just go once a week. The rest of the time I'm running from home at five in the morning, but uh, I go to the trails once a week and I look forward to it all week. I can't wait for that run. And I am starting to see what trail runners have been trying to say all along because yeah, it's just something special. And um, I look forward to seeing where that goes in myself, but it's nice to hear someone else say that. And I, I watched a video, an outside uh, online video of you, and I'll put a link in the show notes to that where you were going for something, which we'll talk about later. But in this video, you talked about being from Ottawa, Illinois, and mm-hmm. you said Midwesterners are often overlooked in trail rankings. They don't, uh, companies don't sponsor athletes from the Midwest. I mean, I had never heard of such a thing, but like, tell us about like, why would that be? Why is that a thing? <laughs> Yeah. So trail racing has, so like some of the bigger races out there are, you know, like Western States, 100 mile in California, you have hard rock 100 in Colorado, you have uh, UTMB over in Europe, but we just don't have the big race basically in the Midwest or even the East coast, which, um, that I guess that sponsors really kind of care about when it comes to like your performances and stuff, which is interesting because in the Midwest and the East coast, we actually have like seven of the 10 oldest 100 mile races in the country or something like that. Mm -hmm. But it just doesn't draw the same field of runners. I would say as something like a Western States and doesn't get as much publicity So, um, like we have a lot of really great trail runners here in the Midwest and even the East, and you just don't see them getting sponsored by big name companies. And that was one of the biggest struggles that I had just, you know, as a younger runner, because without having say that professional athlete here in the Midwest, I didn't even know who to talk to Mm. about approaching sponsors and sponsorships and, um, trying to figure all of that out, um, along with figuring out what my race schedule needed to be. And so I was still, I was living in Colorado for a bit and then moved back to Illinois, but I was still racing like probably 75% of my races were out West. And so then it becomes, all right, like here I have to go fly to California for this race and then fly back. And then like three weeks later, I'm flying back to California. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of that that went on, but it's just trying to build that resume. how much I love my athletic greens. You hear me talking about it all the time and with good reason. I cannot give to you enough words to describe how much I love this product. This is one of my favorite things in my life. I trust it so much. It's just, I guess I should explain if you are a first time listener. Athletic Greens is the ultimate daily all-in-one supplement with 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food source ingredients that work together to help the body absorb and synthesize these nutrients in a highly bioavailable form. There is a reason that Tim Ferriss says this is his number one supplement. If he could have one supplement, this is the one he would take. There is a reason Rich Roll loves it. There is a reason Michael Gervais loves it. There are so many people out there who are big fans of this product and it is for good reason. I really take pride in the brands that I work with and Athletic Greens is one of those brands that I trust. I mean, 75 vitamins, minerals and whole food source ingredients in one scoop of powder that you can throw in any drink. I have it first thing when I wake up in the morning so that it is absorbed right away and gets going. It gives you adaptogens, antioxidants, prebiotics, probiotics and this superfood complex that's going to help support your body's nutritional needs across the critical areas of health, including energy, immunity, digestion and recovery. Now, as you can use this as a comprehensive approach to your nutritional support, Athletic Greens Ultimate Daily can replace a multivitamin and a number of other supplements commonly taken by elite and professional athletes. It can make it easier for you to get this comprehensive nutrition without the need for taking 12 different pills in the morning or having these complex routines. And I'm excited to tell you that my listeners, you can get a one year supply of vitamin D3 K2 with your first purchase. That is a one year supply. We are going into the winter months. We know that vitamin D becomes very low uh, in a lot of us. That is one way you can protect yourself. It's also a great way to keep your immune system up 
and uh, keeping your body in top form, even without being outside in the sun like we had been all summer. So you can get that by going to athleticgreens.com forward slash Tina. That's athleticgreens.com forward slash Tina. This is absolutely my favorite product that I take every morning. So go get yourself some Athletic Greens and I can't wait to hear what you think. Probably 75% of my races were out West. And so then it becomes all right, like here I have to go fly to California for this race and then fly back. And then like three weeks later, I'm flying back to California. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of that that went on, but it's just trying to build that resume. So you think it is about where the races are located? You think that's the kind of reason that the kind of West Coast and Colorado, those are mountainous areas that people think of. You think that's the reason that they tend to get sponsorships? Um, I do think there's quite a bit that goes into that and yes. Um, and part of it is also just like training because like now social media comes to be, you know, a big part of athlete careers and stuff. And like, I guess it's easier to sell a pair of shoes if you have someone running on mountains than if you do have them running through cornfields. <laughs> but, but at uh-huh. the same time, it's like, you know, the Midwest is not just cornfields and the East coast is not just cornfields. And we, we had, well, Illinois doesn't have mountains, but there are plenty of mountains east of the Mississippi. And there's a beauty in like all of the trails that we've been on. And so like, that's been one thing I've just been really trying to push with sponsors and just be vocal about it. Like, Hey, don't forget about us. Cause like you're trying to sell a product and there's a lot of people out here that would absolutely love the product. If you'd support athletes out here. For sure. That's so interesting. And, and, uh, I live in St. Louis and, you know, I never would have associated trails with St. Louis, but where I've been going out to is in, well, I've only really explored one of the major uh, parks, but just absolutely stunning and something I would have never expected. So I think I fall into that category of just, yeah, never would have seen it because all I think of is as out West. So I'm glad you're bringing attention to this and, and thank you. And how did, how did North Face come about then if, if this was the case? Yeah. So, um, I think it was trail runner magazine and they, they wanted to do an article about like, what's it like being a black openly gay man in the trail running world. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I don't want to talk about that right now. I actually want to talk about the lack of sponsorship (laughs) for Midwest and East coast athletes, because there are a lot of us out here and I feel like we're just getting overlooked. And so they're like, okay, then like, that's not where we saw the story going, but let's run with it. So they put the story up and, um, basically the marketing, the athlete manager for the North face, uh, sent me a message on like all my social media platforms the day that the, uh, that the article came out and it was just really funny because I thought it was a joke. <laughs> so was it from was like, like a random small name or did it say the North face, like the account oh, contacting it, you? It said the North face. And okay. so I was just like, I thought it was a joke. I'm just like, there's no way the North face is contacting me. So I just deleted it. Oh my God. <laughs> and so I didn't respond for like two days. So then she contacted me again on like all forms of social media. And she's like, Hey, like we really want to start chatting with you. Like let's talk. And I was like, so I sent an email back, like, all right, like, if this is true, then please give me a call at this number, you know, and she called and I was like, Oh, okay. Did you think they were going to send you like one t-shirt and then be like, thanks for, you know, was that going through your mind that they were just going to kind of want a lot from you with not not much? Or was it a case of, I literally think this is a a fake email or something? I just thought it was, I just thought it was a fake email because like, I just didn't, be like, it's just, it's the North face, you know? <laughs> and so, and so I just, I thought it was a fake email at that time. Huh. Oh, okay. Well, I'm glad that you did give them the chance and, and it was able to work out. And, uh, did any part of you feel frustrated that you kind of like, Oh, now you want to talk to me that, that you've kind of been given any publicity or were you, uh, once you realized it was actually for real, uh, were you just excited about it? I was very excited about it. And like the big thing for me was, um, I just knew that the North face kind of had not necessarily an older team, but they have a very experienced team. Mm -hmm. And I was pretty young in my trail career at that point. And so that's why I just didn't think that, um, 
that's why I just didn't think they were contacting me, but like, I'm super happy that they did. Yeah. Really, really cool. And, uh, part of a, a, a VF brand, which I am, I'm happy to hear in, in some mm-hmm. weird way that makes you my teammate. So I'm going to, I'm going to take that. All right. So absolutely <laughs> going on to, uh, you know, just more about you, uh, you've talked openly about being quite a shy person yet. <laughs> if someone was to look at photos of you participating in, in, in trail races, you definitely don't give off that vibe with your choice of attire. You definitely like to be seen. Now, there's two things I want to ask you about that. One being, you know, someone else who is shy, who is listening um, and maybe feels that way, that they have some area within their life that they can almost put on a like a, a superhero outfit. Is that kind of how you view it, that you're putting on your superhero outfit and it allows you to be confident and, and speak out and, um, and and maybe it's not confident isn't the right word, but allows you to kind of be more than you would normally be. Tell us about the choice with the attire if you feel you are a shy person. Yeah, so it's actually really funny. Um, I was in Florida for a 50K and basically just forgot my racing shorts. Mm-hmm. So I had a few speedos with me cause I'd planned on going to the beach after the race. And everyone's like, it's fine. It's South Florida. Just run in a speedo. It's okay. So I took my Jersey and like cut the top of it to make it into a crop top and then put on my speedo and got on the start line and everyone's just like, cool, whatever. Mm-hmm. So then I ended up winning the race and the photo just went like nuts on social media. And so then everyone's like, well, now you just always have to race in a speedo. And so like, that's what I've been doing for the last basically five years now. Mm -hmm. And it was totally by accident. And so that's, what's really funny. But now it's like, I have raced mostly in a speedo for, I guess, five years. And, um, I always pick out, you know, some fun pattern or whatever. And then when it comes to bigger races, I try to find like the most obnoxious speedo that I can just because, um, why not? Yeah, no, I love it. And I definitely encourage people to go check out your social media to see some of these speedos that you've come out with because they are pretty awesome. And then the second part of this, I know this wasn't consciously the decision on that first time, but uh, one of my previous guests, um, Alex Will, talked about how she consciously chooses to wear bright pink and bright colors when she's out running, being a black woman, feeling like people will then know that she is a runner and she's not anything suspicious. Has that come into your decision making in in, in any part or is that not even something you think about? You know, I am actually super thrilled that the North Face new athlete kits are like safety orange right now Mm -hmm. because with the state of the world, I do think that it's actually something you do have to think about. Yeah. And so, yeah, I have I have been thinking about that recently and uh, I I seem to always run in either the orange or the yellow. Um, And so I hope that people figure it out that I am actually just out running. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, it's sad that we have to, you have to say that and think that and, and feel that. And hopefully things are changing in, in, in that way. And you did speak about that again in the outside online video about running through people's uh, property at uh, one, two in the morning and that being a, a conscious thing of, am I going to be safe here? But yeah, I mean, it's just good to keep reminding people about this conversation because I think for most white people, they never would, I mean, maybe a female, but males would never really have to think about things like this. So um, thank you for for speaking about that. And then uh, just another part of you uh, coming out age 26. I'd love to hear, like, did did you have, you know, that being quite late in your life to actually say it out loud. How was your self-compassion towards yourself before that moment and and after? Yeah, yeah. Um... I was, I was surrounded by a lot of very good people at the time that I was coming out. So that was an amazing thing. And, um, it actually first came out to some trail runners, mm. um, that I'd been hanging out with and they're all just like, yeah, we know. And <laughs> I, was like, <laughs> I was like, how do you know? And they're like, come on. <laughs> I was like, okay, like fine. Um, but then like I came out to my high school friends, like I did that in a group text and a group text. Every, yeah. Like, okay. and so, cause I was still living out West and, okay. but I was like, I'm going to come out to my, some of my high school friends and they're all just like, 
yeah, like we've always kind of thought so. <laughs> I was like, it's like, honestly, I was like, okay. And so it was like, everybody I was coming out to is just like, not surprised. Mm-hmm. So when I actually came out, um, my, at that time, fiance, now husband, uh, we had been engaged for four months, I guess it was. Um, and we were actually getting married like six months later. So you, this so, was in secret. You two had been in a relationship or did anyone yeah, know? Yeah. No one knew? Um, a few people knew. Like, okay. people that I had been running with, they knew. And then, uh, like, we got, like, an engagement ring type thing, just a small little band. And so because of that, people started seeing this ring on my finger. But, like, when I'd come home for a holiday or something, I'd actually take it off. And so, like, my family didn't know. So, yeah, there's a lot that went into that. But, like, when I came out, it was the week before, or well, the week of the Birmingham Marathon, because Birmingham was on Valentine's Day in 2016. And so I basically just put up a post of us after we got engaged on Facebook. And I'm like, hey, I'm getting married in July, and it's to a man. <laughs> and, like, everybody was totally fine. Like, it was all positive feedback. I think like one person deleted me off Facebook or something and maybe like two people on Instagram. But other than that, it was nothing. And so for me, it was like, huh, well, I guess, you know, like I thought this is going to be a bigger deal and now it's not. And Mm -hmm. so like, I'll just focus on this marathon. And that's when I went from 237 to 228. Taking (laughs) that stress off. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. And so it was just, it was just kind of really funny. And I was like, all right, like, this is good. Mm -hmm. I love that. And my, uh, my daughter's, uh, two-year-old daughter's been, uh, we always get books out from the library and she has this one book called, uh, not quite narwhal. And it's about a, um, a unicorn that lives in the ocean and then it comes out and sees other unicorn and then it goes back to the narwhals and says turns out I'm a unicorn not a narwhal and all the <laughs> narwhals are like yeah we knew that already so it's kind of funny hearing <laughs> you say that because it's like a real life example okay so then I would love to just discuss for a minute about you've spoken about saying that um, being a gay man is just one part of you yet it's interesting that people from marginalized groups are often defined by whatever makes them in the marginalized group, uh, even though, as you have said yourself, there's so many different parts to a person. Do you have any, any idea on why that might be and, and how we can change that so that it isn't people are defined by which marginalized group they belong to? Um, that is a very interesting question because... People like to just put other people in boxes so Mm -hmm. they know how to place them or whatever. And for me, like, you know, I'm I'm a human. Like, yes, I am a (laughs) black gay man and I'm also a trail runner that likes to go run really far. But like at the end of the day, like we are people. And so that is why I like to say, like, yes, I am black and openly gay, but that's a part of me. Mm -hmm. Um, and even like trail running, being a trail or ultra runner is a part of me, but that's not the only thing that I like to do. And so I guess that we just, we all just have to really kind of reframe our thinking about, you know, how, like basically it comes down to treat people how you want to be treated and Mm -hmm. like, just, and like, that's, you know, kind of like the number one rule. Yeah, (laughs) Um, absolutely. Do you think 2020 has made it worse? Uh, yes. And so like even the other day on Facebook, like I posted something and it was like these two ladies sitting there like talking about pizza and they're like, Hey, you know, we can disagree about pizza toppings, but we're not going to disagree about racism. And like, it was just super funny. Cause like, no, like sure. Just treat people how you want to, how you want to be treated. But then someone decided to send me an inbox message and they're like, well, you are just contributing to the division of this Mm -hmm. country when you post memes like that. And I'm like, no, really not. Like, I'm like, honestly, like (laughs) there is a good way to treat people and a bad way to treat people. And like, if you have a problem with a meme that I posted about racism saying that it's wrong, then like, maybe you need to like, check yourself, you know, mm. but so it was just funny. Um, cause I still think about that comment and like, honestly, like you've been following me for how long and 
and now you're upset about this because yeah so I would imagine most of my listeners having listened to many podcast episodes where we've been covering this would understand this but for someone who doesn't quite understand why you would need to 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 draw attention to racism, to kind of almost separate people of color out, to bring them up to a level of, of white people. Can you explain like for that person, why that would be the case, the person that sent you an inbox there? Yeah. So when I get these messages, I normally try to treat them with compassion and respect and just, you know, say, Hey, like, this is how it's been. Like, it wasn't that long ago that like a black person wasn't even considered a full person. Mm -hmm. Like it wasn't that long ago that interracial marriage was illegal. Like there are very basic things that people of color couldn't even do. And so now we are just trying to get to a point where like things are just equal. Like that's all like, we want to be treated the same. And so it's it's just funny when people don't seem to understand that, like, these are just basic human rights issues. And, like, it's not only for black people and people of color. It's also for the LGBTQ plus community. It's for all of the communities that have basically not been treated equally mm-hmm. uh, for basically eternity. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Thank you for explaining that. Just wanted to put that in there just for anyone who is, I, I would imagine most of my audience already knows, but just in case. All right. So speaking of that, so you you recently uh, got the FKT, the fastest known time for the Ice Age Trail, which is 1200 miles across uh, Wisconsin. Did you start three or four days after the George Floyd murder or was it that was when you were preparing just uh, that point for me. Um, I started three or four okay. days after. Yeah. So you had that three or four days well, before uh, George Floyd had been murdered. Um, it was also, you know, COVID time still is. June is also Pride Month. Well, having all those things going on, in addition to knowing you were about to uh, undergo this very strenuous, intense process, did that give you extra motivation or did it give this kind of extra pressure and kind of draining feeling going into it? Um, so for me, I would say that it didn't add pressure. Um, and I, I guess it was basically like, there were just a lot of bad things going on in the country and the world, but especially this country. And I was like, Hey, you know, like this will give people a, positive story, um, and something that they can follow, something to look forward to. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I'm also a person of color going out and doing something positive right now. And so like, I really felt like that was a story that I wanted to be told. And it was just interesting because, uh, my photographer is from Vegas. And so Kevin is awesome. And he ended up doing most of our social media, but it became this really funny moment when he sent me a text. He's like, I don't know. He's, I'm not sure how long it's going to take me to get there. Cause he flew in like a couple, no, he flew in the day before, but he was flying into Minneapolis. And at that point they were shutting down the highways. And, and so he's just like, I don't know if I'm going to be able to get to the start of this. Mm-hmm. Like, I'll let you know when I can. And that's when, like, the George Floyd incident really became way more real, just because I'm like, oh, well, that's that's right where it happened, you know. And then the Ice Age Trail starts only about an hour north of Minneapolis on the Wisconsin and Minnesota border. And the first 350 miles are pretty remote in some, like, more rugged terrain. But you're also going through extremely small towns in northern Wisconsin. And so... At that point, we were just like, we don't know how like race relations yeah. are in just places. And so um, with, you know, two black men and two white men just pulling off this process is just like, all right, like, what are we getting ourselves into? And it turns out ended up being a great thing. People were super friendly, super polite 
a lot of the people that came out onto the Ice Age Trail to help support in whatever way they could, like some of them weren't even runners, and yet they're still like, oh, well, I'm going to bake some cookies and drop them off oh, for you cool. or make some food and drop it off. Mm-hmm. And so, like, it actually restored my faith in humanity a bit. That's good. So basically, we need a thousand Corey Walterings to just place <laughs> around the country to, to help with help with the uh, division going on. So... Uh, I don't want to spend too much time on this. You have ha- covered it recently in quite a few different podcasts, but you you did end up running the FKT in 21 days, 13 hours, 35 minutes. And uh, that it broke the previous record by five hours, despite, and I'll p- again put this video in the show notes, rolling your ankle and basically having to walk for how many days? Three days in the middle? Five. Five, five. days in the middle because you couldn't run. And so I really encourage people to go watch that. You also raised $30,000 for Feeding America. So just quickly, why Feeding America? Why did you choose that to raise money for? Yeah, um, you know, if you're going to take on a big project like that, I figure it's great to basically make it about something other than yourself. Mm -hmm. Although I guess with June being Pride Month and the George Floyd (laughs) incident, and like it really wasn't necessarily about me to begin with. But like with COVID and people losing their jobs and their Mm -hmm. businesses and everything, there's going to be, you know, people are going to need food and there's also going to be a food shortage. And so because of that, um, I really just wanted to raise money for a cause that, uh, I believe is trying to do some good. And so like for every dollar donated, it can provide up to 10 meals. And so because of that, they've did like, some like 4.2 billion meals or something last year, like just an amazing amount. And Wisconsin food banks, um, there's about 60 of them, I believe that also pull from feeding America. And so like, I just felt like that'd be a great thing to do. For sure. And how does that make you feel thinking about how many people you kept alive and sustained by just doing something that you love, but also raising awareness? Do you you stop and think about that often? Yeah. Yeah, that's really, really cool. Yeah, I think it's awesome. And especially like during the FKT, um, like one of the reasons I just didn't want to quit was because I'm like, well, Mm -hmm. if I quit, then people aren't going to (laughs) donate. So I'm like, I have to keep moving forward. Yes. And and so you did. And and I, I think that's another great example of, you know, not giving up because had you given up when you rolled your ankle or a few days into it, you never would have you would have always had that regret, but also you, you did end up getting your legs back and your ankle did come around and you ended up way ahead of the um, FKT anyway. So really cool story there. And I encourage people to check it out. All right. So let's talk about world's toughest race. Um, now in the series, uh, Clifton, who was your team captain talked about how he'd been racing, um, adventure races for 20 years and noticed that no one looked like him. Now this is a common theme in this episode, but Tell us about how that came about with Clifton, uh, that you were going to be on a team with him. Did you know him before? I did not. So he, uh, he reached out through Instagram. You seem to, that's how I got you as well. Eventually. (laughs) Yeah. That's how a lot of people have been doing it. Um, and so it was really funny. He just sent me a message one day and he's like, yeah, um, eco challenge is coming back. It's going to be in Fiji. Are you interested in racing? Did you know what it was an eco challenge? Yes. So I remember watching it as a kid Okay. and, and so then he's like, yeah, I'm trying to put together the first all African American team to race, uh, basically any expedition length adventure race, especially an eco challenge. And I was just like, he said Fiji. So it should be white sand beaches, blue water. (laughs) And I'm like, ah, you know, I'm like, "Mm." I went back and forth on it for about 10 minutes. And then I finally said, yes. So, so he was like, great. And he goes, I found everybody else. I went through Instagram as well. So he was like, we're just waiting on you. I was like, all right, then I'm in. So we put in our application and I was in Illinois, but then I was in Hong Kong for a race when we got the email that we were in for Fiji. And I was just like, oh, my goodness. I'm like, I'm like, all right, white sand beaches, blue water. This is going to be fun. And I was like, now I have a lot of skills I have to learn, which is funny because like 
for Cliff and Chris, they both had um, adventure racing experience, but Michaela, our, um, crew person and Sam, um, and myself, like we did not have adventure racing experience. Mm -hmm. So, uh, that's a lot to take on in basically like a six month time period or something like that. But yeah. So which one, as you were training and, and kind of learning these new new skills, which one did any of them kind of take you aback because they were tougher than you thought? Climbing was difficult at first, just because like figuring out what gear to use and how to use it and what situations to use it in, um, but that was difficult for me. And mm -hmm. so, um, I actually spent a lot of time on ropes and like, I would get just to a point where I'm like, okay, like I cannot figure this out. And everyone's like, well, we're just going to leave you hanging here until you figure it out. <laughs> and so, and so like, there are a lot of times that I had experiences of just being on ropes for multiple hours, just being like, what am I doing wrong? Like, why is this like, and so it was awesome that I had that experience. Cause in Fiji, like there's a giant climb, but, um, it took me a while. And then like, once it clicked, it was like, Oh, this totally makes sense. And so now like, I love climbing mm -hmm. and I love climbing with gear because it took me so long to figure it out. And I'm like, this is awesome. Hi friends, just want to pop in here to tell you about our black owned business we are featuring this week. This business was recommended by Corey himself. He told me that the, the owner Max is the first professional black triathlete, which I think is absolutely awesome. And he is an entrepreneur. He started his own business, a coffee lover, as many of you I know are also coffee lovers. So this should be something that appeals to you. Fen Coffee sought to deliver on a need affecting many triathletes needs, which is high quality coffee with a low acidity to minimize the effects. Anyone climbing their own personal mountain knows that when hitting plateaus, pushing to the next level, it requires more. Innovation, improvement, something better. And that is where he came up with the idea for Fen Coffee. So after spending some time in the professional circuit, Max knew there was a need in the market where those who were pushing their boundaries could come for reliable mid-race burst. We all know the experience of needing that. He needed something without the effects on your stomach that might come from a pre-workout or your run-of-the-mill coffee. He needed something smooth yet strong enough to gain the focus needed to go push those PRs. And you can attest that that is a very important thing when you are mid-race. I am excited to share that this is a fair trade coffee, organically grown beans, family and women runs farms. It's a low and zero emission roasting. They have an employees first mentality and it's just a wonderful place. You can go onto their website at fencoffee.com. That's F-E-N-N coffee.com. There's all kinds of apparel you can get there. You can obviously get the products there. You can get cold brews there. There is just a lot of ways you can go support Fen Coffee and go support Max. That's F-E-N-N coffee.com. Check out fencoffee.com. And so it was awesome that I had that experience because in Fiji, like there's a giant climb, but, um, it took me a while. And then like, once it clicked, it was like, oh, this totally makes sense. And so now like I love climbing mm -hmm. and I love climbing with gear because it took me so long to figure it out. And I'm like, this is awesome. So did you have like a long list of, of activities and you just kind of would like today I'm going to take on climbing and tomorrow I'm going to take on paddleboarding. Like, how did you, how did you know what to practice? Uh, they sent us a list of basically like, these are certifications you need to have. And then these are like basically certificate not certifications, but like you have to go with an instructor and they say like, yes, you're competent to do X, Y, Z. And so they have to actually sign off on it. Um, so like we, as a team, we all flew out to California, uh, for like a three day weekend so that we could get our whitewater and swift water rescue and climbing, um, like certification type things. Um, and, but that was also the first time we had all met as a team. Mm. And so that was really cool because, you know, even though we had never done this expedition length adventure race type thing before, um, you still got to see 
how you would react when you're in stressful situations Mm -hmm. and like, especially learning new skills. And that was really fun. Yeah, no, I, I I bet that would be, and especially the activities that you were doing there, you know, whitewater rafting, it especially could get pretty intense pretty quickly. So uh, you would <laughs> you would see personalities come out there. That's really cool. And then being the first uh, all African American team in uh, the world's toughest race, did you? And knowing that it was going to be televised, and you had a camera crew with you, did you feel any pressure? Um, I wouldn't say pressure. Um, I would just say you know you we wanted to represent the community well. Um, and, uh, like for myself, it's like the openly gay African-American man. Like I wanted to show like, Hey, like we like to do outdoor sports. We like to go out and get dirty. There are a lot of things we enjoy doing that just, you know, it may not be the most normal thing, but I mean, what is normal? Mm -hmm. And then I know for Sam, it's like, I, I bet she felt pressure because, um, you know, you, it's really hard sometimes to be on camera and not come across as like the angry black woman, which she is not at all. Yeah. But you know, you never know how TV is going to spin something. Sure. Yeah. And so that's where it was like, okay, like we really wanted to make sure that we were being represented well, but like we had no idea how it was actually going to come out. And were you happy with how it came out? Absolutely. Okay. Um, there's still just one part that bothers me, but, um, <laughs> but other than that, it's good. Do you, do you want to share that? Or would you rather not? Uh, it'd be a spoiler alert. So oh, yeah, I think that's okay. Cause I'm about to, I'm about to give a, uh, spoiler alert anyway. And by the way, I've been telling my audience to listen to this for, to li- to watch the series for months. So if they haven't, then that's their fault. Oh, <laughs> perfect then. Yeah. So like when Cliff went down, um, and you have like Bear Grylls in his helicopter. He's like, we have a team down. We have a team down. Yeah. I'm like, like, no, you don't like, you aren't even around for that. So like, that's the one thing where I'm like, honestly, and I think that was like, kind of obvious though, that he, that was like set up like that, you know, the chance mm-hmm. of him being above your heads when that happened was so small. Totally. Yeah, totally. And so then when, uh, like they, he makes a comment where he's like, Team Onyx has left their captain behind. And it's like, that is not how that actually happened. Like Cliff just Cliff is a bigger dude than us. He is also an extremely strong dude. So like we normally were riding slightly ahead of him mm-hmm. because he catches us on all of the downhills and then just blows by us. So we were waiting for maybe a minute at the top of the next hill and like he crashed at the bottom of the hill was getting ready to go back up the hill. So then I was the first one to ride down. Then Chris and Sam came down, but like the show makes it seem like it was just forever that he was, you know, by yeah. himself. And I'm like, no, he was not. And so that's what still bothers me about that. Cause like people have once again on social media been like, Oh, you know, I was rooting for team Onyx, but if they're just going to leave their team captain behind and I'm like, come on. I'm like, honestly, people, this is TV. Like mm. it is, it is absolutely 100% an endurance race. And like everything that we go through, like everybody had to do it, but at the same time, they have to make TV out of it. For sure. For sure. And I think if you actually did pay attention to the series, you could see that when you got there, he had just like, it, it had just happened. It wasn't like, you know, I, I could tell that he hadn't, that he hadn't been lying there for 20 minutes for you. So yeah, I mean, I definitely think people could maybe see the surface of thinking that that, but then if you actually thought about it, you could see. So, but I could see why that would irritate you as well. And, you know, with all that's happened this year, um, in terms of awareness of like systemic racism of the things we've been talking about here, do you feel like that timing, uh, of this coming out was good to give young black boys and girls role models? Um, as a lot of people would have watched, uh, the world's toughest race eco challenge Fiji as like quarantine watching. Yeah, absolutely. But not even just that, you know, you, there are the twins from India, yes. like they were also amazing. Like, so I think that the timing of it was perfect. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's definitely something that we needed because, um, you know, it's not just a story of being, a really hard race. It's also the story of, you know, people coming together and persevering and getting through some really hard stuff. And 
as you get later into the series, I mean, you see teams from other countries just coming together and being like, all right, like we can get through this. Let's yeah. do it. Yeah. So I think that's really awesome. Yeah, it was really cool. And um, Tasha and Nungshi are next week's episode. So for anyone listening, you got a week and then you can hear them. Uh, Yay! So, yes, they are. They are wonderful. So um, you just mentioned the spoiler alert and I'm just going to spoil it even further. So if you haven't watched the show, you've switched, switched off now. But um, so pulling out of the race, uh, do you think, you know, obviously, um, as I think it was Chris said, uh, you have to put Cliff's health first and having had a concussion. And did he have a concussion when he got to the hospital? Yeah. So I'm actually the one that said that um, oh, I said, okay. like I said, health is, you know, the number one priority mm-hmm. and, um, and yeah. And like Sam also, like she once again saw the crack in the helmet, like I missed the crack in the helmet, yeah. Sam saw it. And so like, yeah, it was, he did actually have a concussion. So like, it was absolutely the correct choice. It was a very hard one, but it was the right choice. And do you feel like your experiences as an ultra runner had prepared you to kind of mentally handle being able to to leave the race that way yeah like i so absolutely um just i had been i I did ultra trail mount fuji um in april of that year and like that was it was the blizzard year and so like i wait a blizzard in fuji like a snow blizzard yeah, like so Japan though in April and like oh, there's okay. a sn- okay. yeah, but there's a <laughs> snow blizzard and I was standing at an aid station at mile 90 and they just go we have to call the race because of the snow and I'm like I'm 15, 16 miles from the finish of this thing. And so like that was like one of my big just disappointments of the year. But at the same time, like I think that that moment also really prepared me for mm. Fiji because then in this moment, I'm like, all right, we have to think about our health. Uh, we need to think about our gear. And like, honestly, it's like we didn't, we would have needed another helmet to continue, but I'm not even worried about the helmet. I'm just like, if he has a cracked helmet, that yeah. means that he probably has a concussion. Mm-hmm. And I've had a concussion. Well, I've had multiple concussions. Sam has had them. Cliff had also had one about three months earlier. Yeah. And so because of that, like, you just can't take chances because you never know what's going to happen coming up. And like, you know, you don't want to take him out into the jungle and then something goes wrong overnight because mm-hmm. it takes three to four hours to get people out of there. Yeah. Yeah. And you did say they did show you saying that and, and, uh, obviously was the right choice, especially hearing what you said just there. And, uh, but still not an easy decision to make. And, and it was tough as well. So admire all of you with your approach to the response to that. So excluding that moment, what was the hardest moment for you during the, uh, world's toughest race? Um, so I really struggled with the Billy Billy rafting. (laughs) Yeah. I just, I could not figure it out. Like for whatever reason, I was just struggling with how to move that bamboo stick through the water. (laughs) And so I was on a raft with Cliff. And at one point he just goes, (laughs) Corey, you're actually not helping us by putting (laughs) your stick into the water. You are hurting us. So please just stop paddling. <laughs> and, it, <laughs> and it was so funny because I'm like, what am I supposed to do? And he's like, stand there and do squats. He's like, I don't care what you do. Just don't go hypothermic standing here on this raft that's basically sinking. And so <laughs> it was just it was just super funny because I'm like, like, we could just we could take this apart and like swim it faster. Like we honestly were just moving that slow. Mm-hmm. But like every team was moving slow. But I. I still just laugh about that because I'm like, (laughs) I don't know. Like it just, it didn't make sense to me. And like, we unfortunately got on the raft in the middle of the night. And so the river was a bit lower and the current was slower. And so that just was not helping us either. But the Billy Billy was definitely one of the mentally hardest tasks at that point. How long were you, you would, was it 10 hours? I think we were like 14 hours on the okay. Billy Billy. Like that's just way too long. Yes. Um, the stand up paddleboard section was also pretty nasty because it was, we were at night on the river and the storm was coming in. So 
I'm pretty sure that like team New Zealand was somewhere, you know, sleeping in somebody's house as we're just out on, (laughs) (laughs) on the river as the storm is coming in. And so like, that was just also a very challenging section because like, we were just kind of struggling to stay awake a little bit, but like we had to keep moving because the cutoff was coming in. And so it's like, we just, we had, we like, we didn't get to sleep when we wanted to. Mm-hmm. There's also more that people don't know about this. Um, when we were on the ocean coming back from like the 21 K trek or whatever, we had a boat malfunction that actually ended up breaking our boat apart just in the open ocean. Oh. And we had to be rescued. And unfortunately they don't have the GoPro that was on our boat. So like they don't have any of the footage from that. Oh, oh wait, but, wait, did it sink? Like what happened to it? Yeah. So like the arm broke off, like I got thrown into the ocean and I found like the rubber strap that was holding, (laughs) I found the rubber strap that was holding this arm together. So I'm like, I think I can put this in. They're just like, our boat is unbalanced. Like we need to drop the sail, like all this stuff. And they just couldn't get the sail drop fast enough because we were in the current. And so because of that, the wind hit the sail at the just wrong angle and flipped the boat. So we have all four of us in the ocean at this point. Like, okay, you know, not too bad. Uh, we shoot off the first flare and nothing. We shoot off our second flare, nothing. We go to our emergency radio and it's just silence. So here we are. Were you like, panicking honest- at this point? Um, not really. Like, that's the thing. It's like, like we, like we have a Navy SEAL and a Marine and mm-hmm. like I grew up swimming. And so like, you know, I was like, whatever, this is fine. Like, this is definitely not ideal, but this is okay. <laughs> so, um, there's a, there's a Fijian fisherman that happened to be on the ocean at the same time. And he's like, I saw you shoot off one flare and just thought it was a joke. But then I saw the second. So I realized like, oh, this couldn't be a joke. So he brings his boat over and he's just like, well, I was making a pot of coffee. Do you guys want any coffee? <laughs> and we're like, what is going on? So we got onto our boat, onto his boat and had like our gear that we could rescue onto his boat. And then we just kind of waited and finally like the race realized, oh, like Team Onyx is like we're in like the top 30. And then all of a sudden, like Team Onyx is just out. Like, where are we? Uh So the race shows up and they're just like, all right. And we're like, what's going on? We're like, well, the arm fell off. Here's the piece that actually fell off of it. They're like, well, all we can do is tow you to the closest island. We can bring another boat out to you guys and then you will continue on. But this whole process took about seven hours. So we lost seven hours of time in there. And that was just the really frustrating thing because all of a sudden, instead of going from doing quite well, now we're almost last. Mm. And and we now just have to keep pushing so we don't miss that first cutoff. I did wonder, actually, because it seemed like you were one of the maybe not, you know, going for the win or anything, but you seemed like you were one of the more competitive teams. And then and then, yeah, you were just trying to get the cut off. And I thought, how did how did I did think how did they end up so far behind? So obviously that um, explains a lot there. And interesting that, yeah, I guess I mean, with TV, you know, they've only got a certain, certain amount of time, but uh, you would have thought they would have filmed one of you mentioning something at some point but uh, yeah thank you for sharing that interesting go on yeah and that's the that's the other thing because like that's just what I also wish people knew because I'm like we we were actually pretty solid at sailing because like Chris is a good sailor Mm -hmm. so like we were pretty good at it but the other thing that happened in that part of the episode was I hurt my shoulder and so like I was struggling with part of the paddling and like they have the filmed interview of like me going to the med tent and like well a medic coming to me I should say and like all this stuff and so like none of this even got mentioned in there and it's like ah come on but like <laughs> and I'm like paddling with a hurt shoulder just oh my goodness because I mean the first three days are just all on water mm-hmm, mm-hmm. well I guess you're you didn't have someone they were mostly focusing on the guy that had heat stroke so uh <laughs> yeah. he, he was definitely the casualty of the uh of the first few days 
Okay, so uh, was either of those the hardest moment you felt as a team? Or was it just ultimately Um, the pulling out part? I think pulling out was still the hardest, but the boat breaking in the ocean Mm. was definitely a good uh, team bonding experience because, like, you know, like... Chris is super comfortable in water. I am super comfortable in it. The other two are, they're very okay with it. And so that was one of those moments where it's like, great. Like if we are going to, we'll figure out like how we all react in like extremely stressful situations (laughs) and everybody handled it great. And so, and so because of that, like it was awesome to like, see that, Hey, we're Mm -hmm. all team players. We are in for this. And, uh, you know, if we can get through this moment, then we'll get through basically anything. That's cool. Great. Thank you for sharing. Did you have any fears going in or what was your greatest fear going in? Um, like, I guess on the show, I said, my greatest fear is like the fear of the unknown because it was my first adventure race. So like, I had no idea what to even expect. Um, but like, Honestly, it was more like snakes, I think. I was just like, I, but like, I realized that Fiji doesn't have any poisonous snakes. And the, so like, they, they shouldn't even be a a fear really, (laughs) but like, still, do you want to be walking through the jungle and have a snake, you know, just be there? Like, not so much. I more feel about like when you're, when you're getting a little sleep or you're resting or something, some kind of animal, like crawling up your leg or something like that's more, I feel would have freaked me out than than a lot of things and like the ju- uh, jungle foot trench foot oh jungle that, that trench kind of foot, freaks yeah. me out Ooh. as well <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, but thankfully you didn't get that uh, and then finally final question have you watched it back which yes is the answer uh and which other team either watching it or that you were around inspired you um watching it back i think spain i mean with emma as their captain like mm, she's tough mm. yeah. so uh, and they're all tough. I just love the part after the swim when her teammate is in there basically hypothermic and they're trying to pull them. And she's like, nah, he's fine. She's like, <laughs> just, she's like, just give him a few hours, let him warm up and then uh-huh. he'll continue on. Uh-huh. And like, that was just really awesome to watch that because I'm sure that there are many teams out there that absolutely would have pulled out if their teammate was in that situation. But like that just shows how great of a captain she is because like she, uh, she knew that he wouldn't want to pull out of the race. And so she's like, we'll get this done. And then, um, the team from Brazil is also pretty cool with like a three female team. Um, and then like, I bet they'd race as an all female team if they could, but they had to have a man. Well, I think Uh, didn't, it was the, wasn't their fourth teammate. She, um, she passed away if, and that was uh, the, the man was the husband, I think of the, of the, uh, fourth teammate who they used to compete together. Yeah. yeah, Pretty cool story. And, but I believe that, uh, eco actually changed the rules so that every team has to be a co-ed team now. Um, but yeah, so like, I thought they were really cool though. Um, and it was just fun to hear their story and to see them out there doing their thing. And, um, at like, I don't have kids and like, I never want to have kids, but it was really cool to see like, yeah, you know, like back then when we were racing, we didn't have kids, but now we do. So like, that's what gets us through this now. And I'm like, Oh, that's really cool. Yeah, that was cool. Thank you. No one has highlighted them so far. Um, so I appreciate you sharing that. And, uh, for the listeners, Emma's episode is in two weeks. So you get to hear her story as well. Although you did give a spoiler alert to what happened, (laughs) (laughs) but we'll, uh, we'll let you, we'll let that pass. All right, Corey, where can people go find, follow you, find out more about what you're up to? Uh, I'm just super active on Instagram. So Corey Woltering on Instagram, uh, I do have Twitter and I have an athlete Facebook page or whatever. Uh, but like, I'm definitely the most interactive on Instagram. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for, for your time, for sharing the stories with us, for giving us a little secret of, uh, of the show and yeah, we appreciate you and all you're doing. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. My friends, if you have a minute and you could leave a review on your favorite podcast player, Apple Podcasts, aka iTunes, Stitcher, Overcast, Pocket Class, Spotify, or whatever else podcast player you use to listen to this podcast, or if you would subscribe to this podcast, you will help me get out in front of new runners to make our tribe even bigger and even better. 
It might not seem like you as one person can make a difference, but really it helps a lot. And it shows me you appreciate the hard work I put in for those. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to Corey for coming on the podcast. I had a difficult time finding a time to record with him, but we managed to work it out. And I'm very grateful that we did because what a person to have on the show. I admire him for so many reasons. And I love that he is really interested in getting runners, trail runners and ultra runners in the Midwest sponsorship contracts and just some attention because that's something I had never considered, but it is a very important point. And being in St. Louis, I'm definitely considering myself in the Midwest. So I understand what he is saying there, but I really enjoyed it. And I encourage you, if I didn't say enough times in that episode to go watch that outside online video of Corey, there is a link in the show notes. What an inspiring story, particularly because in my head, trail running had always been this thing where if you fall over, you're going to roll your ankle, you're done, you're out for six weeks. It was too risky. But Corey showed that he continued walking and hiking on a rolled ankle and it turned itself around after five days, which I thought was absolutely amazing and just inspiring for me to hear about. I don't know about you. I want to take a moment to thank Generation You Can for sponsoring this episode. You can use code TINAMUA25 to get 25% off your order. I love the cookies and cream protein powder. I have two scoops and some coconut water. I used that in my trail run last weekend. You can also use code TINAYOUCAN15 to get 15% off if you are already a You Can fan. Don't forget to go get yourself some of those bars as well. They are absolutely delicious. Now, next week, I am excited to bring you two more of these eco challenge guests being Tashi and Nungshi Malik, who are twins from India. You're going to get to hear more about them. This is a great episode. If you have young girls in any capacity in your life, this is going to be an episode for you to learn and to help to inspire these girls, maybe even have these girls listen. This is going to be a great one. On Friday, I have a special episode with Dr. Libby Weaver, who is the author of Rushing Woman Syndrome. You probably heard me talking about this book. Very, very lucky to get Libby and I can't wait to hear what you're going to think. So thank you so much for listening. I'll see you on Friday. Thanks for listening to the Running For Real podcast. Be sure to check out tinamuir.com for show notes and even more helpful running information.